everybody. This is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Montana. We've got more folks in the AR community than you might expect in Montana. We're going to make sure we get you the details you need for Bozeman, Helena, and our friends working the land out there in eastern Montana all along the river there. You've got a real mixed bag in the Montana outlook. I'm going to give it to you straight and let me tell you there's a lot you can do to prepare for what's coming. There are some challenges in this outlook, but you got a survivable situation on your hands, and I know you all are going to do what it takes. Before we get into the details, I want to give you some background about what's going on in the world of climate. When I founded American Resiliency in 2021 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C regularly at mid-century. That was the consensus science, but that was that. 2023, as you know, was a very serious year in climate. You can see on this figure here from the Copernicus Institute, which is the EU's climate outfit, that we hit 2C for a couple of days towards the end of 23, and we were around 2C for a few days in February in 24 this year. Switching over to the monthly average view, you can see that the average for March of 24 was 1.68C over baseline. The April average was 1.58C. Glad to see that number going down a little bit. We're not out of the woods yet here. You can see from the data, anyone who tells you 1.5C is somewhere out there in the future, they're just not up to date. That all forces us to change our thinking. So this outlook here, it's a 2C outlook. As far as timeline goes, we're all gonna find that out. Let's check the challenge level for Montana at 2C. So you know where to find the source material. This forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment. We got the NCA5 in November of 23. If you wanna follow along with me with figures, go to chapters. You can come down here to all figures. They're downloadable. You can get all of them for offline use. I also use information from the NCA Climate Atlas sometimes. If you want to explore the same great county level data found in the NCA5 Atlas, thanks to our wonderful AR volunteers, this particular one was spearheaded by Dustin. We have Dustin's tool set here, an original resource that is smooth, responsive, and lets us look at how that NCA5 data interacts in new and different ways to help us predict factors like wet bulb risk that weren't calculated in the original NCA5. No matter how we're playing with those publicly available data sets, it's important to know that Dustin's tool set is based on the identical same great data to the NCA5 Atlas. It's just a little more user friendly because I want you to be doing your own research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without too much work on your end. And we're using this data, the NCA5 data and figures because they represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this information and you deserve access. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. Honestly, that made me so mad I had to found American Resiliency. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. Here in Figure 1.14, looking at national overview for changes at 2C, you can see Montana is somehow almost entirely in the moderate change band, with a corner in the northern high change band to the northeast and a corner in Utah's ominous high change blob to the southwest. Your total projected heat up across the state is 4 to 6 degrees. That's degrees F. Let's see how this change climb interacts with Montana's well-established change landscape. You all have a lot of variation in those landscapes in Montana. Let's take a look at what 4 to 6 degrees F of overall change is going to mean in terms of impacts to seasonal extremes. Let's go over to figure 2.11. So I know this figure is enormous, but even at a glance, we've got a complex picture there, don't we? That's what we would expect, of course, with your elevation range. I'd like to direct your attention to a bit of good news. Let's look over here at this corner in the warm nights map. We can see that Montana is experiencing very little nighttime warming in these projections for 2C. If you're at all interested in ag outlooks, you should see that warm night increase is going to have a big impact on agriculture across the country. In areas in Montana where you have enough water for cropland, in areas where you have potential for sustainable irrigation, your outlook is very strong on the ag side. But when I look at what concerns me just at a glance, I don't like this situation here. Right in the Idaho panhandle, I think that this is very concerning. We have identified a lot of fire risk in that high change spot there in the Idaho panhandle, a much higher rate of emerging fire risk than we expected from the NCA4 data. In this NCA5 update, we're going to see how badly that danger may impact Montana. Let's get some more info before we get too worked up, though, and that'll start building our understanding of the summer heat increase. We're zoomed in here on that then on your hot day increase, projected increase in days over 95. In Bozeman and in Helena, you can see that you're not looking at no change, but you're looking at less than five additional days a year over 95 at the 2C projection. That's not too bad. If you've got the water, I think that's a mild enough stress your mature trees could make it. 
And I know you all are accustomed to average summers in the 80s there, but you may get enough crazy weather as a baseline along with your occasional heat waves that this level of hot season increase doesn't necessarily put up a red flag to my mind, not for Bozeman and not for Helena in a typical year. But let's look at this another way. Let's check your increased wet bulb temperature risk by 2C. I'm gonna put a link in the video description for a short video that you can watch to understand how we calculated this wet bulb temperature risk and what it means. You can see that at 1.5C, which is where we are now, your risk of really serious killing heat is quite confined to a few places in the country. By the time we move up to 2C, it's important to know how much bigger the risk can be in many places. In Montana, let's zoom in a bit. You can see here that up in the mountains, we've got some pretty good looking counties at risk levels one and two. But right on the map here, you can see that the heat up in the state's agricultural areas could be really challenging. We're looking at a big change with up to four additional weeks where people could be at risk for dangerous heat. And it's a good thing we're looking at these composite tools instead of just the figures, because if you looked at just figure 2.11, you wouldn't see the full impact of heat facing eastern Montana. Some of our producer counties are picking up a lot of extreme heat. Custer County, for example, is looking at an additional 12 days over 100, and that is an information that shows up on figure 2.11. But if you look at this wet bulb risk tool, it'll sum all of the dangerous information together in one place. Towards the eastern edge of Montana, in areas where there's already enough water for agriculture, you're going to have the potential for a longer growing season, but you're also going to need to cultivate heat resilience. People are going to need AC who maybe haven't had it before, and your water needs are going to go up as the heat goes up. The things that will save your yields there would be the relative lack of nighttime warming. Talking again about Custer County, even though you're seeing another month of hot season, and it'll be a really hot increase to your hot season, you're projected to add less than a week of additional nights over 70. If it's cooling off at night, even if you have potentially dangerous heat during the day, crops can grow, the body can regain strength at night. I'm sure we're all seeing that the water outlook is going to be just critically important here in Montana. We'll get there, I promise. But before we get into the details of the water picture, let's check your winter change. Look in 2.11, you can see there's a big change to the west in Montana, a big loss in cold, talking about more than a month, fewer days below 32, and about a month of freezing temperature days lost. Even down in the plains in eastern Montana there, you're talking about a solid three weeks less below freezing. That's a big change. So that's the change in duration. Let's look at the change in intensity. Figure 11.3, this is, of course, another unusably huge figure. We're going to zoom in on SNPs for Montana in just a minute between the present-day climate normals and this mid-century projection, which is about equivalent to 2C. It's worth noting that 3C information is also readily available, but I feel like we got to take this problem one step at a time. Let's go to the SNP. All right, this gives us a clearer view. That's just zoomed in on two snips out of 11.3, and that looks freaking intense in those mountains on the western border. That's a big change. I don't, I don't like it at all. But the rest of the state, eastern Montana, you're kind of picking up the ag sweet spot in your plant hardiness zones. That's sort of zone 5, zone 6A. That used to be the sweet spot zones that fell over Iowa and western Illinois, where you had really great crop production historically in our areas. It's a nice cold winter. It keeps pests lower than they could be. And we're going to have a big problem across the U.S. with the spread of invasive pests. Across Montana, you're looking at about a 10 degree lift in winter lows. That's a big change, but you're still in true cold territory. The winter, it looks cold enough to hold snowpack everywhere except right in the west, right by Idaho. It does look pretty disturbing there. I'm hopeful the fire danger won't be as bad as it could be, but we got to read all the cards here before we see how they're going to come together. Let's check that water picture. All right, in 210 overview, it looks like you're looking at a little bit more water, about 5% more water across the state. That's going to be useful with those increasing high temperatures. It's hard to say if that's going to keep up, though, in this area where we're expecting a lot of increased heat. Let's look at another view in figure 4.3. This figure 4.3 shows increased precipitation in terms of inches. This lets us see that we are looking at substantially more rain right along this mountainous area here in Montana. Not right in that sort of hot spot by the border, but this might be a wall further in. And what's really important is contrasting that against your projected changes in maximum annual snow water equivalent, because that's where you can see where is the hydrology going to change really bad 
We looked in Oregon, we saw that they have a big loss of snow water equivalent without a big precipitation gain. Along this line in Montana, that's your biggest loss in snow water equivalent, but you do see a precipitation gain. That's good news. That may help to sort of trap your fire risk over to the west of that point, but that does look problematic in this far west of Montana. We're seeing a lot of signs coming together for fire. It does seem, though, like your potential loss of snowpack looks like it might be about met by an increase in precipitation once you get away from that danger point, and that is good news. In Montana, you know, we're on the same page. Sometimes good news means the news isn't as bad as it could be. You know, this is going to represent some change in your water cycle throughout the year. You're going to be getting a little more precipitation as rain instead of snow, but you still have potential for snowpack, so you have potential for continued snowpack-fed landscape through much of the state. The landscape will tend drier from that change in the snowpack, but the impact will not be as dramatic a change as they're going to need to weather further west, where we're looking at very intense hydrological changes once you get into Idaho and west. All right, we're looking at 7.4. We're checking the fire map now, and as we'd expect, it's a big fire increase because it's hotter and drier and you're going to have decreased snowpack. We're talking about a four to five times multiplier on your current fire risk. But that doesn't mean freak out. It means build fire resilience. I would bet the risk here is concentrated to the west of those shaded areas of Montana because that's where we see those underlying risk factors all concentrated is to the west there. Building fire resilience in Montana means making sure you've got a landscape margin where fire can't jump to your house. It means making sure you conceal your home against embers, which is how the California DNR has taught us most homes burn, is from embers getting inside the house and burning it from the inside out. In Montana, Protecting against fire is also going to mean controlling development so that you don't get a lot of new construction right where it's going to burn right in those forests. Development in that urban wildlands interface means creating corridors of fire that bring fire into town. Doesn't sound desirable investment to me. You'd be better off building up than out in Montana. In Montana, all in all, this is a really balanced picture. You're facing change and you're facing an increased threat of fire. Building resilience against fire in the state, especially towards the west, is going to be a critical task. Towards the eastern plains, you'll need more resilience against extreme heat. And alongside these challenges, you're also looking at some real opportunities. Your ag outlook is great. These changes will unlock a longer growing season. It looks like you're going to get the water you need to make that happen. And if you took a glance at the rest of the nation when we were looking at those overview figures together, you may have gathered that the outlook for the southeast and the southwest is going to be challenging. So anywhere we see an edge, we want to hold that edge. And I know you all can hold this one. For people who like a nice population center, it's worth noting that the major cities of Montana look like they have very stable climate outlooks. This being said, in the context of a fairly rowdy local climate, but they look good. If you like them how they are, they're going to keep on that way. Montana, I'm wishing you all the best. I think there are plenty of folks, they might see this outlook and think about joining you up there. Let's look clearly at what's coming, both the good and the bad. Let's get ready. Thanks. Thanks for watching. And I want to thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions. They're keeping this nonprofit rolling and growing. If you want to donate, there's a link on the about page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. As a special note, I'm on the lookout for a solid climate data set for Mexico. I think more and more of us are wanting a Mexico overview. If you've got a lead, email me at ar at americanresiliency.org. Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.